Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Jackson. I'm the director of CUSP, the Center for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity. And we are delighted to welcome you to uh, this webinar this evening. Um, the webinar forms part of the Economic and Social Research Council's Festival of Social Science, which runs throughout November and in which CUSP has participated a number of times in a number of different events. And this is, if you like, our grand finale from those Festival of Social Science events. And it's a webinar dedicated to the launch of a book written by one of our CUSP co-investigators, Peter Victor, about the life and work of the man who in some sense can be said to be the source of many of the ideas that we work with in CUSP, Herman Daly. And I'm delighted to say that both Peter and Herman are with us tonight on the webinar. And we're also joined by a couple of people um, as panelists on, on the webinar tonight. In particular, I'd, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Patricia Perkins, who is a, teaches ecological economics and um, feminist economics at the University of York and uh, Catherine Trebek, Dr. Catherine Trebek, who is the co-founder, as many of you will know, of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. She worked uh, for, for Oxfam for some time before that and is also on our advisory committee for uh, CUSP. So it is, um, it is a, a CUSP event. It's an ecological economics event. It's very definitely a University of York event as both Ellie and Peter are from the University of, of York. And in some sense, it's a, a mark in the tide of history to celebrate the work of, of Herman Daly. Um, and I, I know that one of the themes, certainly from the speakers as we go through the evening, will be the extent to which Herman's work has influenced what we have done uh, during our careers. And I would just like to pay right at the beginning my own, my own homage to that. Um, Herman's was one of the first pieces of work that I came across um, when I was uh, looking at the question of economic growth and the question of sustainability and without even knowing it, actually becoming involved in the field of ecological economics, which to some extent can be said to have been founded by uh, the work that Herman has done throughout his life. So it's, a, it's an enormous pleasure and a privilege to be chairing this discussion tonight. Towards the end of the evening, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. And uh, I'd, I'd like to invite you to pose any questions or comments in the uh, Q&A box, which you should see uh, beneath your screens. And I will keep a close eye on that Q&A and we will um, bring some of those questions into the discussion. We may even bring one or two of you personally to ask those questions into the discussion if you would like to do that and be ready to do that that would be um, a great addition to our conversation but to start the meeting um, let me just turn to you Peter and ask you to introduce uh, this wonderful book which has just been published by Routledge um, and it is uh, Herman Daly's Economics for a Full World his life and ideas. Peter, perhaps you could just talk to us for um, 10 minutes or so about the book itself and the process of writing it, hopefully a little as well. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, before I start, I, I just have to make a small correction to your very kind introduction. As much as uh, Professor Perkins, Ellie, as I know her, uh, admire the University of York, we are actually at York University in Canada and don't want to be confused with our good friends at the University of York. My uh, apologies. <laughs> it's like York a... University in Canada, who are a partner in CUSP. Uh, exactly. <laughs> so look, what I'm going to do is um, give you a, 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 like a trailer to a movie, a trailer to a book. I'm going to tell you um, about the plot and some of the uh, main ideas that are in the book. And if you want to know more, well, it's clear what you would have to do. So I'm just going to share my screen now. I can. So uh, the book um, begins with uh, a couple of chapters about Herman's life. Uh, and then uh, I weave some of those um, I, the experiences into my uh, interpretation of his ideas later on. 
Uh, like all of us, uh, Herman Sartre, as a, as a child, he was born in Houston, Texas in 1938, just before the Second World War. Um, the influences on Herman as he grew up uh, were many, but the ones that stand out were his regular visits to church with his, his mother Mildred, and uh, religion remained a, a very important part of Herman's life throughout. Uh, you'll see there a picture that many of you may not in fact recognize if you're not old enough, but those are iron lungs used to treat people with polio back in the 1950s uh, before they had a vaccine. Herman was a, a polio victim. Fortunately, he did not have to go into an iron lung, but um, he, he did lose the, the use of one of his arms and in his teenage years persuaded his parents that he would like to have it removed. Um, then you'll see um, oh, well, a, a slide showing uh, the, the, oh, sorry, the division between people in Texas. Texas was segregated when Herman grew up there. Uh, and uh, that, of course, has an influence on everybody's, on anybody's life in, that, in those circumstances. One thing that worked in his favor, if you like, is he worked for uh, his high school years in his father's uh, hardware store. And one of the things his father taught him was in fact not to discriminate amongst the customers. And I think Herman learned an important lesson from that. And then in the, in the middle of this, you see Herman at 18, he's driven down to Acapulco with a good friend uh, in a truck, lots of personal freedom in those days. Uh, and then I think um, he would say this, he made the mistake of catching that beautiful fish, but at the time he was rather proud. Herman went to university first at Rice University from 1956 to 1961. That's where he first discovered economics. Um, for him, he thought it was going to solve a problem. He was very keen on the humanities and the sciences, and he thought economics had its feet in both of those. Uh, but he was to discover later when he dug deeper into the subject that in fact, it had its feet in the air, neither in science or in the humanities. And in a way, he's devoted much of his career, if not his whole career, to rectifying that problem. Herman went on to Vanderbilt University in 1961. He stayed there quite a few years uh, to earn his PhD. His first uh, tenure track teaching appointment was uh, 1964 in the economics department at Louisiana State University. And he stayed at that university until 1988. Now, 1973 comes along and Herman publishes this book of edited papers. He writes a long introduction about the steady state economy. I'm sorry, I missed a slide, I must go back. Um, I wanna go back to the 1968 paper, uh, Economics as a Life Science. This was the first paper of real significance in my view that Herman published. Uh, the title is telling economics as a life science. In other words, he was saying economics can learn a lot from biology. Uh, um, to improve our understanding of how an economy relates to the broader environment. So on the left, you see, this is a diagram taken from, from that paper. You see the, the biological processes of anabolism and, and, and catabolism, where useful matter and useful energy are drawn into an ecosystem used, and then degraded matter and energy are released back. And he said, well, you know, it's really the same in an economy, except we talk about production and consumption. Production requires useful matter, useful energy, and ultimately the economy produces degraded matter and degraded energy. And that parallel uh, is really important to, uh, for understanding uh, Herman's approach to economics. So in 1973, he um, went significantly further in explaining how the economy is a subsystem of the biosphere. This square here represents the planet the only thing entering of significance is the sun uh, and waste heat leaves uh, down over here. This is the economy within the biosphere, extracting primary matter, primary energy, recycling some matter, but ultimately disposing of waste matter and waste energy back into the biosphere. Another key idea that came in, comes in in the 1973 book is Herman's view that the economy needs to be understood in three related dimensions, its scale, how, how large it is in a physical sense, relation to the biosphere, uh, the distribution of income and wealth among different people, and then allocating the products that are produced in the economy 
uh, to different people. Now, his one of his major criticisms of mainstream or neoclassical economics is that it relies far too heavily on the market, which is plays a useful role in allocation to also determine distribution and scale, uh, neither of which he thinks it's capable of doing uh, properly, if at all. A third element in this 1973 book was this ends mean spectrum that Herman introduced. And this goes back to his idea that economics ought to be grounded in both uh, physics, looking at the ultimate means, and ethics and religion, looking at what it's all for. But he said instead, it's economics or using the older name political economy is about converting intermediate means to intermediate ends and neglects the ethical and ultimate end version or aspect and neglects where all of this material comes from in the first place. Here's Herman now in 1988, I believe, uh, teaching on a Fulbright scholarship in Brazil. Herman spent a lot of time in Brazil in different parts of his career as is fluent in Portuguese and has a love of the country. Um, it was at that time that he started to talk about the shift from an empty world to a full world. And these graphics below illustrate what he means. Here you have an empty world, a little fishing boat up here and a small net and abundant fish life. But what has happened over time is there's been an incredible accumulation of fishing gear, much larger nets, and of course, a depletion of fisheries. So this is a nice image of what he, what he means by the world becoming full. Um, the other thing that's important to capture in these diagrams, in these graphics, is that um, his view, and I think it's correct, is that what nature provides and what humans make are complements, not substitutes. If you're gonna catch fish, you need fish and equipment. One does not substitute for the other. In 1989, an international society of ecological economics was formed very much to promote Herman's ideas. You can see him over here in the photograph. Many, many very important contributors to ecological economics are shown in this now rather classic uh, image uh, from the a conference that took place in 1991. From 1988 to 1994, Herman worked at the World Bank. I have, unfortunately, he felt he ought to leave academia in the late 80s. He was feeling less and less welcome in his economics department because of the kind of ideas he was finding important. He worked in the World Bank. And when he left the World Bank, he gave a speech which you can read on the internet. He gave advice to the bank. He said the bank should stop counting the consumption of natural capital as, England, as income. Natural capital being, if you like, another word for nature. He saw that the tax system should shift for, away from labor and income uh, to taxing resource throughput, taxing the materials and energy that we use and dispose of. That we should max or the bank should maximize, we of course should do it too, the productivity of natural capital in the short run and invest in increasing its supply in the long run. And fourthly, possibly the most controversial, at least from the point of view of the bank, is that it should move away from the ideology of global economic integration by free trade, free capital mobility and export led growth and develop domestic production for internal markets as the first option having recourse to international trade only when clearly much more efficient. Obviously, this is an attack on globalization running rampant. Two versions of this book, or two editions of this book for The Common Good were published in 1989 and then 1994. Herman wrote this in close collaboration with his co-author, theologian John Cobb. I'm just going to mention one part or one little piece of this 500 plus page book. And it's the description of the index of sustainable economic welfare, where Herman and others have been criticizing GMP, now GDP, as a measure of well being. And they said, look, it includes expenditures on things that are bad, and it doesn't include the value of things that are good and, and should be adjusted. And then we'll have a better index of economic welfare, and we can draw conclusions from that. When he did that with his colleagues for the US, if you look at the decade 51 to 9 to 60, G, GNP per capita increased much more than this index, modified index of economic welfare. The same is true in 1960 to 70, 
70 to 80, where there was hardly any increase in this more meaningful index of economic welfare. And in 80 to 90, it actually went negative. Now, with economic growth measured by uh, GMP still being positive, but things getting worse, according to the index of economic welfare, we have what Herman now likes to call, and done for some time, uneconomic growth. They, Herman um, enjoys debates, and he's been in a number of really important debates that are in the literature and which are analyzed in detail in the book. I'll just run through them very fast. He debated the steady state economy with his professor and mentor, Georges Hirogan. Uh, he debated the relevance of dynamics, of thermodynamics and economics. That was in 91. He deba debated with uh, uh, Professor Baguatio, international trade specialist, the merits and demerits of free trade. He debated the question of if you have scale distribution and um, allocation, you need, you need, you've got at least three policy objectives, you need instruments or institutions for each of them. He, he debated with a philosopher, uh, Professor Saga about ethics and about whether knowledge could replace resources and capital. He debated with, um, sorry, uh, Nobel Memorial Prize laureates Solo and Stiglitz about economic growth in 1997, and again with, a, with another Nobel Memorial Prize winner, Kenneth Arrow, uh, about are we consuming too much in 2007. So he loves to debate, um, and the book goes into those debates in some detail, as I said. Then in 2014, Herman has received many, many awards. Uh, this particular one from Japan, the Blue Planet Prize, very prestigious. I, I will read the citation. Professor Herman Daly redefined steady state economics through the concept of sustainability by incorporating such factors as the environment, local communities, quality of life, and ethics into economic theory, which led to building a foundation of ecological economics. He has been questioning whether economic growth brings happiness to humans and has been issuing warnings to society which tends to overemphasize economic growth. As a consequence, he has had a significant intellectual influence. So just to bring this to a close, here's a photo of myself and Herman taken in 2018 when I spent the best part of a week with him, uh, interviewing him um, about uh, his life and his ideas. And I thought that was very valuable for writing the book. Now, I don't know what was on his mind as we had that photo taken, but here's the sort of thing that I was thinking of. Herman is a gentleman. He's well liked and, and widely admired. He's an original thinker, an excellent writer, and he'll debate anybody. And I'm, my conclusion, having done all the research and writing the book, is that his ideas for a full world are more relevant than ever. That's the trailer. If you want to know more, please buy the book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. Um, perhaps to open the conversation, um, I could turn first to you, Herman. I'm, I'm not going to ask you, though I'm tempted to, how it feels to be looking at photographs of your much, much younger self, <laughs> or, or even, you know, how it feels to read, read about yourself in, in, that, in the way that Peter has so graciously done in the book. Um, perhaps I could perhaps I could start with a, a sort of more fundamental question. What if you were to identify something in your life that was a first cause, original cause, so to speak, something that sparked the journey that your intellectual life and professional life took you on? What would that something be? Well, my goodness, I guess the the first thing I want to say is that uh, tomorrow is Thanksgiving Day here in the uh, U.S. I know you have a different day in Canada, but uh, you and Peter and Nitty have given me so much to be thankful for today. I, I, uh, I'm amazed. Regarding your question, you know, what uh, sparked or started, it's, it's very hard to say. You know, looking back, uh, it is quite an experience to read someone's interpretation of your life and ideas. And I think Peter's is pretty accurate. <laughs> I learned some things about myself. Uh, I, did, I learned that, that growing up in Texas, 
probably had more of an influence on me than I had really uh, realized in later years. Uh, I suppose observing, as he pointed out, Texas at that time was totally segregated and uh, let's say pretty racist place. Uh, and so, you know, one group, it doesn't take a whole lot of intelligence to realize that something is wrong with that kind of system. And uh, I guess where I learned that something was wrong was really uh, in church, although the churches have not always been at the leadership of opposing segregation. Uh, even as a child, I uh, sing Sunday school songs about Jesus loves the little children, uh, red and yellow, black and white. Uh, that impressed upon me that things aren't always correct that the way the world is could be terribly wrong. And I suppose that carried over into other elements. Uh, when I got into economics, you, you know, you just sort of accept the way things are. I started out, of course, as a growth economist. I was totally interested in, um, in economic growth as a cure to poverty, both in Texas and in Latin America. And, um, it took me a while to grow out of that and to see that there was something wrong there. But maybe one of the things that uh, that, that early experience with uh, what's wrong with the world, uh, you know, I guess I might also add one further point. You know, one of the things they used to do with school children at the time was they would give you a picture and then the, 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 the caption was, what's wrong with this picture? And the picture is very clever. It looked just right. But if you studied it carefully, you would find something that was very anomalous, couldn't possibly be the case. And so uh, I guess that way of looking at the world, you know, what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with what, what you're being presented? That, that came through later on in, um, in the circular flow diagram of the uh, standard economic textbooks. And this, of course, I learned directly from George S. K. Rogan. He was, he was really the first to point out the way that was. And I, I had looked at that diagram for years and years and never seen anything wrong with it. And then uh, he opened my eyes and I said, well, this can't possibly be right. So I guess those are some of the things that pushed me in, in that direction. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that, that um, question of grace. I mean, that, that point at which you tip from sort of understanding growth as a cure for poverty to understanding a growth-based economics as a part of the problem. I mean, is it, I, I can't really imagine because it was some years before we, any of us on the call were, were trying to follow in your footsteps. But at that point in time, that must have set you at odds, first with the economics profession, and then later, of course, with the World Bank. Um, and yet somehow you stuck to your guns in relation to that. What, what, what was it that kept you sticking to your guns in the face of, of that kind of, of antagonism, opposition? Yeah. Um, well, I suppose it was just the, the uh, pure logic. I, I, as I said, I really started out as an economist and I, I, I thought it made a lot of sense. And uh, microeconomics, has a, uh, a, a when to stop rule. In other words, you, you have uh, something grows, it's a firm or a household consumption as it grows that increases costs and it increases benefits. And you have the law of diminishing marginal uh, utility, diminishing benefit, a law of increasing marginal cost. At some point they become equal, that then you should stop growing at that point. Well, that's very logical, that's just math. And um, I said, well, why doesn't that apply to the global economy? I mean, the, the macro economy. Well, because we think of the macro economy as if it were the whole. Well, the whole grows into the void. There's not, no opportunity cost, it doesn't work. 
But in fact, the macro economy grows into the ecosystem, which is a larger whole. So it, is, it too is a part. So the economics of the part really applies to the macro economy as well as the micro economy. And that, I, I couldn't escape that logic. You know, I said, well, well why not? Why, why, do we, why, why do we have a when to stop rule in microeconomics and no such thing in macroeconomics? And so um, that, um, that brought, and I, you know, it was a gradual sort of thing. I, I was, uh, I, it did occur to me that I was very much in the minority and that, <laughs> that there, therefore I might be wrong. And so that was, uh, I guess, one of the reasons why I did, I did seek debate because uh, not only I am sort of cantankerous, I suppose, by nature, but also, you know, I might be wrong. And so convince me and, and stop me from making a bigger fool of myself than I already have. And so that's, that um, was part of, uh, part of it. I, I absolutely understand. I mean, huge respect really for that because that's a, not only, you know, a way of prosecuting science and proper science to be continually questioning, but it's also in some sense a very challenging personal path to take. I mean, as people develop, they can become very comfortable in their views and look for support from those around them, from their peer group and receive accolades from that peer group and be promoted to far-flung places and, and high positions um, in, in terms of status. And yet to choose a different path is actually something uh, quite rare. And I suppose, you know, that pursuit of logic is obviously one of the things that's very, very important to you. What's, what, what would you regard as the things that have sustained you as you fought those sometimes very lonely battles? Well, um, I, actually, they, are, they were lonely battles. I should say that in ecological economics, uh, I did have some support. In fact, I had some really good teachers and uh, really excellent colleagues and uh, partners. And so it, it was not entirely uh, me against the world. There, there were good people uh, who helped me and who I tried to help. And that extended all the way. I mean, I could give a few, you know, from uh, Robert Costanza, John Cobb, uh, Robert Goodland at the World Bank, uh, Brian Check with Cassidy, Peter Brown at the University of Maryland, uh, Joshua Farley at the uh, University of uh, Vermont, uh, Bill Reese and Ma Mathis Walker, Nago, Clovis Cavalcanti in Brazil, uh, Juan Martinez Allier. I mean, there, a lot, there were other people that were on the same path. And so um, that, that was a big encouragement to me to find these people. And I found some of them, they, some of them found me and, and we began to cohere. And I think that was what uh, we got together uh, with Costanza, me, Anne-Marie Janssen, Juan Martinez Allier, and we started the International Society for Ecological Economics. And as I point, uh, it had to be an international society because there were too few people in any one nation to, to do otherwise. And um, so, I, so I did get some help and very much, and it wasn't entirely uh, lonesome. So there was that. Um, well, I get, I get, and um, although I have not received a whole lot of uh, support within standard economics, indeed, uh, mainly criticism, uh, outside of economics, it just as you as you discovered, I'm sure, the there's a whole lot of uh, criticism of the profession of the economics profession. And so many people outside of economics are very eager to see some uh, criticism and constructive uh, reform of economics because it's just so important. Uh, so that that was a, that was an encouragement as well. Yeah, thank you. And 
I mean, obviously, I, I guess the question that comes from to my mind from that is, you know, the extent to which actually progress itself depends on um, setting oneself at odds with consensus. And, and, you know, that seems to, in some sense, be what you achieved with the kind of remarkable legacy of positioning this critique of growth at first at the margins of economics and then, or at least hopefully, then that critique itself becoming moving more and more towards the center. Do you see a do you see more openness to to your ideas um, in the last few years than there were in the early days? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I, I guess to continue with your previous question, I mean one of the things that that also influenced me in the, in uh, being an outsider or um, being on the margin was I read uh, Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. And that, that I began to see, well, gosh, these, these kinds of things happen in all fields. I mean, even physics, uh, uh, ideas don't just triumph. Uh, people have to, generations have to die and new generations have to come along before some ideas make it into the uh, to the canon, and you see that in religion. You see that in in physics. You see that everywhere. Why, well, why not economics? I mean, maybe maybe we've just really made a, a fetish, a, an idol, out of economic growth, and we've neglected uh, the the legitimate criticisms of growth. So that that gave me a little confidence as well to uh, to see that. Now I've, I've babbled on and I've forgotten the point you. Well, it was a question of whether you saw progress. So, so oh. yes, you know, there's some some acceptance of those ideas, greater acceptance of those ideas. But yeah, you said I, I think, you prefaced it with yes and no. So. Yes and no. <laughs> well, yes and no. Uh, the well, you look at the uh, ecological economy. I think we've made a lot of progress in ecological economics, but uh, so that's that's the positive side. Uh, there are people, good people working in the area, and I, I've been fortunate to be associated with, with many of them. Uh, but at the same time, we are also a minor countercurrent in the mainstream, which is sort of hell bent towards growth. And the mainstream has not uh, really <laughs> recanted in any significant way. And in fact, uh, it seems to be getting worse when you read what's happening in the world. So in that sense, um, I think we've, we've got a long way to go. And, uh, and I'm hopeful that future ecological economists will, will uh, do a better job than we older ones have done to convince uh, the mainstream. Thanks, Herman. Um, there's quite a few questions coming in, and I would encourage you, I saw a couple of raised hands, but I just wanted to encourage you, if you would, to put your questions in the Q&A box, which you should see under uh, the bottom of, of your Zoom screen, and, and I will try to get to some of those. Some of those are actually asking, you know, sim questions about where do we go? How do we get more to the mainstream um, and, and where the challenges lie? So I want to come back to that a little bit. But before, before doing that, let me turn um, first to you, perhaps, Ellie, um, and ask you for some reflections. I mean, I mentioned right at the beginning that a, a part of your interest is in, in feminist economics. And I, I guess there's some sort of interesting points about the relationship between the ecological economics that Herman sketched and and the interests of a, of a feminist economics. I wonder if you could speak a little to that and also to your um, reactions to to Peter and Herman's presentations. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I would like to just point out a couple of connections between Herman's work as uh, summarized and, and described so well by Peter. Uh, and, the, and the field of feminist ecological economics, which of course has many variants and many, you know, there are many people who see themselves as feminists and as working on economic questions and do, who might, might not call themselves feminist ecological econ economists. But in general, 
um, Herman's writings do mention equity and the importance of more equitable distri distribution of wealth, not just income. And Herman has also raised the focus on community-based econ economies and on provision for the distant future as a common good, as a public good, and also the recognition that caring for everyone is in the interest of all. These are all points that Peter makes very well in the book. And I think that feminist ecological economists of many persuasions do see these as crucial pillars of sustainable societies. A priority shift to putting equity first, in particular intersectional and gender equity, intersectional equity, including gender equity. This opens ethical ways to address some of the stumbling blocks which are also noted in the book, whether they're ideological, whether they have to do with inertia, whether they have to do with lack of information or a lack of education and understanding. Gender equity in data gathering in particular, also healthcare and senior care and reproductive health, also gender equity in education intersectional equity and economic opportunities and political access, all of those things accelerate the demographic transition ethically. All you have to do is look at Kerala and other places where equity is prioritized. So not just population growth, but also questions of excessive throughput and overconsumption can melt away if equity comes first. Not necessarily. I mean, it's com it's more, it's complicated, but equity is such an important foundation for addressing all of these things. So I think that uh, demographic transitions to well-being focused societies. I'm sure Catherine's going to talk about this much in much more detail, but that kind of a democratic transition. And also the energy transition, a democratic democratic energy transition depend, it seems to me, on un undoing capitalism's reliance on an exacerbation of social inequities and economic inequities. So I'm wondering, I would like to hear what Peter and also Herman would say about this question. Would an economic system that doesn't rely on inequities still be capitalism? Well, that's a great question. I'm going to I'm <laughs> going to ask I'm going to ask Peter first to comment on that. Thank you, Ellie, for the question. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I you know I um, it's not something that's discussed why very much in the book, so I'm really having to draw on other parts of my brain. Uh, look. One of the things about capitalism is that it defines equity in its own terms. So well, a version might be that uh, if you work hard, you'll do well. That's fair. And obviously, any, so the, the, the conclusion that seems to follow from that, it's not my conclusion, is someone who's not doing well, is someone who's not working hard. Uh, and that's blatantly wrong. So when you say, if you had a more equitable society, could it be capitalist? Well, it would have to, uh, a, a significantly redefined idea of equity would not be compatible with capitalism. Uh, this kind of the, 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 the massive increase in inequality in the distribution of, of wealth and income that we're seeing in capitalist societies uh, strikes most of us as highly inequitable. Uh, so if you're going to tackle that in a big way, first of all, you're going to, you're going to run into opposition from powers that be within the capitalist system. Uh, but I think that in the end, uh, if we were to succeed in limiting the spread of incomes and wealth, very much, by the way, as Herman has been recommending for a long time, that there should be a maximum income uh, to, to complement a, a minimum income. You mm -hmm. don't hear discussion of that very much. Uh, yeah. Then I don't think that that would be very compatible with capitalism, would be my answer. Thanks, Peter. Um, Herman, we didn't test you on this specifically on capitalism yet but where do you stand on it and where would you stand on Ellie's question is a is an equitable capitalism an oxymoron yeah I uh, I guess my the way I've approached that is just to say uh, 
capitalism is where we are. And so we don't really get to choose a blank slate as a starting point. We have historically given initial conditions and those are of a capitalist system. And there are many things wrong with the capitalist system. And I think there are many contradictions between a steady state economy and capitalism as it exists. So I, I've been more uh, interested in trying to uh, remove those parts of capitalism, specifically the its, its uh, increase, ever increasing scale of the economy and its ever increasing uh, maldistribution of wealth and income to tackle those things directly and then say, well, what kind of, what do you want to call a system then which, which results? Uh, I, I really don't care if you call it cap, uh, modified capitalism or eco-socialism or something. I'd really, I'd like to call it steady state economy, of course, but that's, uh, so I haven't gotten too much in, into that uh, debate. I, in, it, it quickly gets you into, into Marxist economics. And I agree with Marx in terms of his uh, emphasis on class exploitation. That was, I think, completely left out of standard economics, not, well, largely left out. Uh, but um, I, I get, when you get into that, I, you get dragged into Marx's historical determinism and, uh, and these things, which uh, I, I really don't agree with at all. Where would you answer that question, Ellie? I think that um, what Herman just said in terms of the emphasis being on the scale, like Peter's slide had those three um, issues of scale, distribution, and uh, what was the other? Can you Allocate, allocation. 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 All right. From an ecological perspective, and then I can understand how a student of Georgescu Rogan would, would think about this, right? Um, the, the, the material throughput, the ecological implications of the economy are certainly very important. But what I was trying to point out in um, bringing a more feminist lens to all of this is that the equity piece, the distribution piece, might well be the key to the other two and to doing those, to making them happen ethically and democratically. And so the, I, 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 I don't really, I mean, I, we're moving into a time now because of the climate crisis where it seems to me the question of what we call, what economic system we call it is becoming less and less relevant and what its impacts are for people, for people's lives, for well-being, you know, and, and to refer to another one of Peter's slides, the ultimate goal here is well-being for, for, yeah. for all, right? And so that has to do with distribution, but it also has to do with a, a longer vision or a more comprehensive vision, including the scale of the economy within the, within the Earth's ecosystems but also who is benefiting from that economy? And I think, I, I just wanted to kind of see what you would say, Herman, about a shift towards an equity focus, towards prioritizing equity, um, maybe as a first step. Yeah, um, well, I think that's a very important first step. And I think that's totally, um, consonant with the ultimate end, you know, is I mean, or, that that's what brings ethics into we, we order our intermediate ends with reference to some concept of an ultimate end to give to know what to put in first place. And I think uh, that equity, equality, and particularly in, in the feminist case, I mean, equality and equity for women. Uh, who have not been blessed with that over the years uh, compared to males who have, have uh, had a dominance in, in most uh, systems. So that kind of equity is important as, as well as the distribution of wealth and income. 
So I would I would say that's that's very high uh, on the list. And then I don't know, you know, I, I I'm not I've not had the um, I don't have the capacity to include specifically uh, feminist uh, economics, uh, you know, black economics, every other kind of of special uh, economics because I just don't know enough about it. But I know in the case of uh, the, uh, we got into it a little bit with the uh, index of sustainable economic welfare the problem of including uh, what has traditionally been considered women's work, unpaid work in the household, uh, you know, giving that more value. Um, so there are many ways in, in which I think this is a, I would consider this an opportunity for future development. I don't think it's been adequately dealt with yet in ecological economics. Uh, and I think it's, an, it's a field that I look forward to seeing more people work in. Thanks, Herman. Um, there was a point there where you teed up uh, beautifully uh, a question to Catherine, um, because you talked about the ultimate end and the ultimate ends as being, uh, to some extent, well-being for all. Um, and of course, that is almost the strap line of, of the leadership that Catherine has shown in this, in this space. Catherine. Maybe first of all, tell us a little bit about that framing of the ultimate ends in terms of well-being, but also um, perhaps reflect on the influence that Herman has had on the development of that idea. Thanks, thanks, Tim. And I, I want to say thanks also, of course, of course, to Herman for this incredible body of work that has has really you know, rolled out the carpet for so many of us to dance or walk or journey and and I mean it, it I don't think we can underestimate that contribution you have made to a wide and diverse movement um, when it as, as you've already spoken about Peter and as many of the people you spoke to in the the journey of writing the book have also identified but Peter I think what you've done is, is this most beautiful synthesis of that incredible body of, of work but doing so into, as you we saw with your slides there, just interweaving with the, the social and the personal and the socioeconomic and political context as well. And I, I think your, your term that the great debates, uh, the sort of intellectual tussles, I, I think really speaks to that, this beautiful phrase, I think Oscar Wilde said that, that all great ideas are dangerous. And of course, you know, they have to be because they're, they're upending orthodoxy, but they, they also can be dangerous to the holder of those ideas or the propagator of those ideas because, and, and we saw that, you know, the story of the jobs not being got or rewards not being given and, and so on, just by virtue of challenging that orthodoxy that I think is still so profound and tightly gripping so many of our political debates and so you're Herman you said you know to, in answer to Tim's question around the, the influence or how, how are we going with this this journey this intellectual journey of being able to question growth you, you answered well yes or no my reflection would be it's I think the influence is certainly noticeable but still nascent and and I think that really I, I think that the onus is on us, this wide, diverse, multifaceted, rich, creative movement of people, activists, thinkers, uh, writers, doers around the world who all share that sense that surely we can disentangle that question of means and ends. Surely with all the wisdom this world has and all the compassion this world has, we can figure out that the economy in and of itself, let alone growth of the economy, should never be an objective up there as the ultimate objective. Surely we can put it back in its box and think about designing the economy so that it serves our ultimate goals. And that's why we sort of put the, the almost the adjective of well-being in front of the economy, saying we, we need this economy to be designed in a way that delivers concertedly and proactively human and ecological well-being. But but I do really feel I think there are hopeful signs that that conversation is is starting to break through. It's certainly pockets 
rather than some coherent movement within within politics. But but I think we are seeing recognize you know, the, the circular economy agenda. I think inherently recognizes the need to understand the economy as a subset of the biosphere and and you know to be, add to Ellie's points around really understand how you know the economy is a subset of society and the care economy as well as feminist economists have been telling us equally for decades i think we're starting to see you know pledges around climate emergencies where from governments we're seeing efforts to start to protect and talk about nature-based solutions to me one of the i think most astounding moments was last year when you had the Dasgupta review and this particularly not because so much of what it said because it did recognize the embedded nature of the economy within the ecosystem but because of who commissioned that report now the Dasgupta review was commissioned by the UK Treasury and it's a commission into the economics of biodiversity and I think that to me is extraordinarily hopeful this in quite incredible well-resourced report you know things we could debate about it absolutely but coming from the UK Treasury starting to really remind us about the flaws of GDP and the really put a square and center the embedded nature of economy and I think that does show that some of these ideas and, and in no <laughs> no small part because of Tim's work and in his engagement and pushing with inside government. I also just want to reflect on just how that, that duality, that yes and no, that two step forward, one step back, as someone once said, that's a cha-cha-cha, so we should enjoy it. But, but Peter, you, you quote the 2008 Commission on Growth and Development, um, and you quote it as saying, growing GDP is evidence of a society getting its collective act together. And Herman, I think the, the response you said was, well, a growing GDP could be a sign of depleting natural resources and, and so on. And, and I was really struck that it was, of course, just a few months after that commission that you quoted, the Commission on Growth and Development, that saw growing GDP as evidence of a society getting its act together, just a few months in September 2009, we had the report, the so-called Stiglitz Commission, you know, with... Um, commissioned by President Sarkozy, the Commission on Measurement of Economic Con Performance and Social Pro Progress that, of course, took your many decades of work on the index of social and economic welfare and then really put some rocket fuel behind, that's an inappropriate metaphor, so forgive me, but really put some rocket fuel into the beyond GDP debate. And we've since seen, I think, a lot of progress in terms of recognition of the flaws of, of GDP. I, at least in my, my tiny, humble little window into this, I don't think I need to explain to civil servants anymore the flaws and the perverse incentives that are bound up in GDP. Does that mean that we've pushed it off its ill-deserved pedestal? Absolutely not. But I think the debate has certainly moved on. And I, and I think to me, that's just one example of the noticeable but nascent influence. But I will say that's on us that's on all of us in this movement to make it go beyond nascent and really make it matter to the extent it needs to matter. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I, we have, we have a, an astonishing number of people with, with questions, some of them which we're kind of slowly covering off, um, but a few and, and as, as many or more that we're, we're not, we haven't yet touched on. Um, some of them relate to that sort of question of, of how we persuade um, a mainstream that may not already be where we are. And I, I'm gonna try and get some people to talk to that issue. Um, so let me first ask um, Joanna, who is going under, the Jack Santa Barbara. Um, if you could maybe ask the question that you wanted to ask, Joanna. Um, if I promote you to panelist, I might even we might even be able to get you to join the conversation. Worked very well. Um, warm warm greetings to everyone, uh, and especially to Herman. Herman, I've I've long been curious about your religious orientation. And wonder if you might if you might say a few words about um, that strand 
in the development of your thinking. It, it's my impression that those who, those uh, who are thinkers in the realm of ecological economics are strongly driven by ethics, but that few are noticeably driven by by religious thinking. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear what you might say on that. Okay, well, hello, Joanna. What, what a pleasure to see you again. Is that Jack sitting next to you? Uh, before I try to answer your question, I have to say that uh, going back to the previous question about people who help you, um, certainly you and Jack helped uh, uh, Josh Farley and me with our ecological textbook, not only with financial support while writing it, but also with uh, ideas. So I'm grateful for that. As for, I, I think your question is, is to my mind very important. Um, and I'm frequently asked something like that. I mean, because, um, well, religion. Let's go back for just a minute to uh, St. Paul who said, uh, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, I reasoned as a child. And when I became a man, I put away childish things. I think that people very often have put away childish things, which we all need to do, because what you learn as a child is very often childish. But not everything you understand or learn as a child is childish. Some of it really does stand up to uh, rational criticism. And some of the things that are being that are used to replace a religious perspective on the world. And I make a, I think do not stand up to rational criticism. And so one of the things I've, of course, as Peter emphasized, my upbringing and was religious. I did try to put away childish things, but I tried to keep those things which were not childish. And so what I thought was not childish was a resistance to the, uh, what I encountered in, in, the, in the intelligentsia and, and particularly in, in uh, a basic materialist view. I don't mean materialist in the sense of consumerism, but materialist in the philosophical sense of the world is reducible to matter and energy and everything, including your thoughts and ideas, are uh, determined in that way. So this kind of deterministic materialism, which is uh, now flies under the flag of so-called scientific materialism, appropriated, uh, um, I, I just find that unconvincing. Uh, I am not a robot. I do have free will is directly experienced. And I find intelligent people such as Alfred North Whitehead, who with his radical empiricism says, you don't just write off your own most direct experience uh, as unscientific and accept some hypothesis of materialism as giving a material explanation of something that you experience directly, which is contradictory to what you experience directly. So for those reasons, I think that there's a spirit dimension in, in our lives. We are physical beings, but we're not only physical beings. And I, uh, so the, I've always felt that this uh, uh, correction for an ultimate end was, was a way of um, bringing uh, religion. Now, I mean, not everything that flies under the flag of religion is wor is worthwhile. There's a whole lot of garbage. I agree with that. But that's back to the issue of putting away childish things and figuring out what's what's not childish. So, um, I guess one other thing is uh, one thing I learned from. George S. Q. Rogan and, and that in well that ends mean spectrum that Peter pointed to. If we go down to the bottom, if we want to really be materialist, 
and explain the world in terms of uh, physics and low entry matter energy and so forth. Well, what is the economic system in purely physical terms? Well, it takes in useful, organized, structured matter energy, low entry matter energy. It grinds it up and it throws out disorganized, scattered, dissipated waste matter and energy. So it converts useful stuff into waste, which is a kind of idiotic process. You know, why do you want to grind up the useful parts of the world into waste? Well, you do that because that's necessary to maintain life, the maintenance of life and enjoyment of life. And so the maintenance and enjoyment of life are uh, requ uh, require that generation of waste. And why, what is it that's good about life? Uh, John Ruskin says, there is no wealth but life. So I think that that leads you, that pushes you in the upper direction of reasoning about an ultimate end, a hierarchy of intermediate ends. Some things are better than others. How do you know? Uh, so now, the fact that I think all that's extremely important doesn't mean that I haven't you know, a totally convincing answer to it. I just struggle with it uh, like everyone else does. Thanks, Herman. Um, do, you, do you feel that, that in a <clears throat> slightly more secular world, there's a kind of secular route to that same question? I mean, it is something that religions to some extent have, have um, been curators, guardians of that idea of, a, of, of ultimate ends. But, but it is surely to some extent a fundamentally human question. Is there, a, is there a sense in which modern institutions could embody some of what we perhaps have lost from religious institutions guarding that question? Well, I think that there's a logical push within the secular reasoning world that if you have uh, you know, many different objectives and ends uh, that you, and you have scarcity, then you need to have some sort of ordering of ethical ordering of what goes in first place, what goes in second place, and so forth. And so once you say priority, then that sort of means something has to go in first place. And that then is a pro an approximation, I suppose, to an ultimate end. So in that sense, purely logical thinking would, would force one in that direction. Uh, but um, I think we have a whole lot to learn from philosophy and religion and theology in reasoning about that ultimate end. Thanks, Herman. And thanks, Joanna, for that question. Um, I've, I've wanted to promote uh, Helena uh, for the question that you asked um, in the, in the Q&A, Helena. Um, perhaps you could ask Herman. Oh, you're still muted. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is a very simple one is, why is it that so few economists are seeing what for you and me is so self-evident? Uh, when I go back for a moment to my own development as a, my doctorate is in chemistry of DNA, and what I was taught in graduate school, at least half of it, is not true anymore. <laughs> and, and, and those were dogmas. They were considered real dogmas. You yeah. zip. And, uh, and we didn't, the field did not create some subfield like economy and ecological economy, it just moved forward because it was so self evident, uh, these new discoveries. And yet it seems like we're talking about, Tim, you're talking about how do we convince? Why do we need to convince it? it yes. So why is it? Mm. So the, the question, so the question there is, um, are we seeing something that, that most economists don't see? Why, why is it so hard? Why is macroeconomics in particular not seeing things in the same way. I mean, I guess it goes back, Herman, to your question, you know, have we got something wrong? 
and that continual questioning and probing of the ideas. But is there is there a sense in which that is not happening where it should be happening? Well, that I think that's a very good question, and, and I. Uh, it's interesting to make the comparison with other fields. I know um, talked about biochemistry, and they evidently made a discovered that some things were wrong and made a change fairly rapidly. But in other scientific fields, change has been very slow. It's just um, in uh, you know in physics and others, uh, people uh, generations have had to die before the new pair paradigms come in. And this is why I was impressed by the, the philosophy of Thomas Kuhn and the structure of scientific revolutions. Uh, I think in a way, what happens, I'm, and here I'm just parroting Kuhn's view, that uh, in order to practice science, you have to believe certain things. You have to be a member of the community. You have to accept certain axioms or else you're a kook. And, uh, and so you try to solve problems within those axioms. And sometimes you get to anomalies that are so great that you can't do it. And then you have to go back and change the axioms and that's the revolution. Uh, now, I really don't know why that's not happened in uh, in biophys, I'd like to understand better biophysics. Why, why they were able to negotiate a change, which economists don't seem to be able to do. Uh, I suppose in economics, there's a whole lot of vested interest in the way the system is, because it has put people at the top. So the system must be good because it put me at the top. Uh, therefore, I'm the proof, and that that may be one reason. But uh, I can't I can't answer the basic question that she raised, which I think is a very good one. Is uh, well, you know, why if it's so obvious, why don't other people see it? Well, maybe there is they will. But I so mean, I think. Yeah, to some extent, maybe we could see that they're beginning to. We could see some of what's happening is in in the way that Kuhn perhaps would have described as auxiliary hypotheses, hypotheses that prop up the original theory as it begins to reach the point of transition. And, yeah. and to that, to that well, end, that's, I've... that's the way economics does it. It adds epicycles. Yeah. You know? It says, uh, well, we, we have externalities. Right. Well, okay, well, let's just multiply the number of externalities and and uh, and you know, in, instead of uh, putting what's important internally, let's just keep multiplying externalities. Sure. Um, the, the, uh, as that happens, though, one of the things that happens in you know in that classical paradigm shift, the Kuhnian paradigm shift, is the emergence of these new ideas, new languages, new fields, new attempts to create something beyond an auxiliary hypothesis. And um, I, it's a good point to bring in. Hunter Lovins, as your question, I think, Hunter, and indeed many of the people uh, asking questions relate to that idea of some of these new fields of inquiry, new approaches to economics that are coming in. Hunter, perhaps you'd like to pose that question. Tim, thank you. And warmest greetings to all of you. Herman, it is so wonderful to see you again. Good to see you, Hunter. And, and to see all of you and to have this amazing conversation. Um, a, a quick answer, if I may, to that last question. I think one of the reasons this has not gone more mainstream is we've done a lousy job of storytelling about it. The neoliberals had on Rand, Atlas Shrugged, The Fountainhead, quoted mm. by the then president, um, <laughs> Alan Greenspan, any number of powerful people as most formative in their thinking. Who do we have telling these kinds of stories in ways that are truly captivating? Note for uh, mm. projects in the future. My question was, what do you think of John Fullerton's regenerative economics? And Tim, I wouldn't say that this is a whole new approach because he builds in name on Herman's work, on your work, on Peter's work, on Peter Brown, on 
Vavka stands on on the whole the whole heart of ecological economics, but at the same time, he is I think putting forth something that is new and that I've found extraordinarily useful, particularly the distinction between economics that is at its heart extractive and economics that is regenerative as nature is, you know, in a sense referencing your reference to nature, that it in everything it does, it's creating conditions conducive to life over. Mm -hmm. Well, I like that. And I think that uh, John Fullerton is uh, is a really wonderful guy. I'm guy. He's, he's <clears throat> come out of the belly of the beast, really, in terms of the Wall Street and, uh, and all of the uh, financial economics, and has seen something wrong with that, and has tried to, to, uh, to reform it. Another person of that similar way, uh, that I've been impressed by over the years is uh, Peter Barnes, who has come out of, uh, you know, the, the business world and creating uh, companies and been successful at it. And, and yet has said, well, wait a minute, something's wrong here. We've got to refigure uh, things. I think both of them have, um, have really made contributions. Um, as for a regenerative society, if we understand by that a society which relies mainly on renewable resources and not so much on non-renewables, I think by all means that's important, but it's not going to work at the present scale. I think it re it's going to require a reduction in the scale of the human presence in the biosphere for us to live at a decent standard of living uh, that way without the use of non-renewable resources. So that would, that would be one question which I would have about the regenerative society. I'm all in favor of it, but how big can the economy be and still be supported by um, sustainable yield uh, regenerative resources? Yeah, I mean, to some extent, that is a kind of central question, and we come back in a, in a way, um, to to that question of growth, and in particular the underlying system, the belly of the beast. I think, as you <laughs> described it, Hunter. There, and I, I just wanted to bring John Barry in to ask your question, John, since it sort of relates to that. That's great, Tim. Good evening, everybody, and greetings from Ireland where the concept of economic growth is first tried out by colonialists a couple of hundred years ago. That's a different story. Um, but, but my question, Herman, that's wonderful to, to listen to and so on. Like many of us on the call, you've been a great influence on, on uh, much of the work that many of us do. But I suppose it's around this reticence about capitalism and in particular, my own view, and again, I, I don't know whether others would agree that we, we now have the scientific uh, data that we can see that it's only some version of a coordinated, perhaps not fully planned economy in the old sense that's going to get us out of this crisis. I certainly think when it comes to iPads or children's toys, that the free market fill its boots, absolutely fine. But in what used to be called the old commanding heights of the economy, energy, transportation, healthcare, surely there is a, a, a compelling rationale from a well-being and sustainability point of view that they should move out of being commodities and be seen as human rights and, and, and based on the fulfillment of human needs, which to me is incompatible with a, an orthodox capitalist understanding of the economy. So you want us, you want us to come right back to that big challenge again and, and talk, I mean, in the same way that we earlier were looking at the potential conflict between an equitable distribution and the mechanisms of capitalism you're arguing essentially john that there's a once you extend those rights in an equitable fashion to the basic necessities of life that in itself becomes a conflict with capitalism well we're essentially talking about decommodifying you know the meeting of human needs and to me that right. seems to be then we're already up and against any conceptual defense of a recognizably capitalist economy. Now, we don't have to call it socialist, but it seems to me that once we start decommodifying, that then moves us out of 
you know, a capitalist frame of, of reference. Without coming coming back to the your original um, antipathy, Herman, to, to 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 be talking about languages um, and to be captured by languages which are often opposed to each other in non-productive ways. Where do you think the mechanisms are for challenging our cultural ethos and and in particular the the way in which a market capitalism has commodified our lives? Yeah, um, well, this is a difficult question and uh, my own confused way of thinking about it is that I'm a little suspicious of decommodification of things. I mean, I don't look at commodities as being in and of themselves a problem. Uh, you buy and sell, uh, nature is based on exchanges which don't have prices. Human beings have exchanges with prices. We've had uh, some experience with societies which have tried to decommodify and to uh, go through social provisioning in some other ways, central planning. Uh, well, I don't think that those, those uh, have been very successful. So I would slow down on that. And I would back up and start maybe with a different perspective and say, um, you know, there are some things, some goods, which are um, rival and excludable, and some which are non-rival and non-excludable. And for those goods which are rival and excludable, uh, you know, the market seems to work okay, as far as I can tell for goods which are non-rival, well, um, the, you know, then the, you don't need a market. You don't need, they're non-rival, they should be free. They should be uh, maybe, maybe uh, things like knowledge, it, it's um, non-rival. Well, it does have a cost of production. Uh, so we should socially finance knowledge, but the knowledge should not be a commodity. It should be free uh, afterwards. Uh, so I, I think going back to the rivalness and excludability distinction, which we do not respect very much, we we take um, we take non-rival goods and make them rival in order to get a price from them. That's bad, uh, and we uh, take. Um, uh, rival goods and treat them as if they were non-rivable and end up with the tragedy of the commons. So I think uh, that to that extent, I, I can see the problems with commodification and modification of capitalism. I don't know, uh, maybe, you know, that's probably an area which I need to think more about. Central planning of the commanding heights of the economy. Well, okay, the commanding heights I take to be uh, fundamentally some limit on scale of the total economy relative to the, to the biosphere and, uh, and some limits to the inequality of distribution of wealth and income. So those to me are the commanding heights and, and there I would really say by all means we need social action and planning uh, to, uh, to take care of those issues. As for uh, other than that, uh, I need to think some more about it. Thanks, Herman. I mean, I find, I don't know about anyone else, but I find something distinctly comforting in the idea that Herman Daly um, is still thinking about economics and will go on thinking about economics for us and for our benefit for some time to come. Um, we are reaching close to the end, and I want to give the panelists, all of them, a chance to, uh, to talk. I know I've covered a bare handful of the ideas and the questions that have come through the Q&A, and I really apologize for that. I wanted to bring in um, one last questioner before we move to roundups. Um, ben uh, Gallant, I'm not sure if you can turn your video on or if not, but maybe you, you should be able to now at least to ask the question. Ben had a question, actually one for Herman. I'd like you to ask both of these, um, one for Herman, uh, which perhaps we could start with Ben. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, um, so um, 
yeah, so the first question was, um, so ecological economics has become a important and vibrant field in its own right, very much drawing on your own work. Um, but it's relative policy influence uh, compared to what we might call traditional economics has remained relatively small. So I wonder what you think about how, given that context, you think about your legacy and the legacy of your work um, and also um, what your thoughts are on the future of economics, uh, where you think it's going to go next and where you think it should go next. Um, did you want me to ask the other question as well? Uh, hold on to the other one for now, Ben. Um, I'll, I'll, come back to, I'll come back to your second question later because I just want to finish on that one. But that, that's, that seems to be, you know, it's a nice general question. It does reflect quite a lot of the things that have been asked in the chat. And, and perhaps I can ask each of the panellists to, um, to reflect on it. But I'll start with you, Herman. Um, yes, things have been slow. And I have, uh, I was reflecting earlier in the discussion on, uh, I know, Tim, you have had experience in working with government agencies and you have had to, uh, you know, deal with the constant dilemma, half, half a loaf is better than none. You know, you want to get something through, so you're going to have to, during my time at the World Bank, it was, uh, I had the very much the same experience. Uh, we had a little saying at the World Bank, some of us that bringing about any change in the World Bank was like moving a brick with a thin thread tied to it. Uh, you know, if you don't, if you don't put any tension on the thread, you'll never move the brick. You put too much tension, you, you break the thread and have to go back and tie it again. My characteristic error was to break the thread and spend most of my time retying it, you know. So I don't know how, how people manage to do that. You have to be a diplomat, you have to have some skills, which um, I, I think uh, some people have, God bless them. Uh, so that's, um, at, so back to the question raised earlier, you, underlying that is, well, if it's so obvious, why can't other people see it, you know? so. Why do I have to drag this brick with a thread? Don't you see that the brick has to move when we have to move? Well, uh, people don't see it. And so uh, I guess change is just slower than, than, uh, than we, we would like. And that's a real problem because we're being pressed by environmental consequences of our actions, which put us on a shorter time frame than our uh, usual ability to change. So. Mm. I, I, anyway, I would say let's maybe we can get a rope instead of a thread, you know, and pull it. Or a crowd, each of whom is holding a thread. Yeah, many threads, thread. like in Lilliput somewhere. Like Gulliver, yeah. Yeah, um, that's that's lovely, Herman. I mean, this is something, of course, Catherine, which you are engaged in in Wellbeing Economy Alliance, um, particularly through the Wellbeing Economy Governments Initiative. Um, how, how do you find that process? I mean, it, it is something in a sense that is at least movable. There seems to be something to play for now in a way that there wasn't previously, perhaps. I think it's a mixed picture. I think there are individuals within government, entrepreneurs, we might call them, who do absolutely get this, who have probably been reading Herman Daly for many of their, their years of, of professional life, but who we exist within the system of government with all its path dependencies with all colleagues who have got other microchips inserted and other mindsets and I think that's why it's really heartening that this discussion isn't so much debating the evidence anymore because I think amongst this audience there seems to be a sense of what's the next wave of this we need to focus on on mindsets and because I think that is the that is the moment of this this journey and there's a lovely phrase Herman that you use around warning of turning to hair of the dog and that metaphor, I think, speaks to what you know, our mutual friend Robert Costanza talks about, the extent to which we have a system that is addicted to economic growth and we need to use some of the techniques of addiction therapy um, to help the patient break that, that addiction. I just want to also just finally say, Herman, I think you model some of the sort of attributes of the sort of politics that will get us there, that sometimes feels all too rare 
in politics that we we see on our televisions and listen to on our radios in the fact that it's you know gentle respectful debate able to challenge and be challenged without retreating into the sort of camps that we so much see our, our politics characterized by and so i think if we can also learn that from you and take that into our politics we might just have a chance of and achieving that mindset shift that we so necessarily need. And I think everyone's really identified that today. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Ellie, let me turn to you for some final reflections. And, and I also wanted to ask you, partly because you placed that question of equity so firmly in the debate, uh, if, there's, if there's a moment at which you coming across Herman's work uh, was influential in the way that you you thought about that or, or again what was what was it that stimulated you to be working in these debates you know I, <laughs> sorry I wanted to say something about that when I was a graduate student when I was a PhD student in the mid 80s and I was struggling with it, my micro and econometrics and these graphs that show this limitless you know out there from which things could be drawn that, that book for the common good landed in a very important place for me. It was, it was so um, validating to have the idea that, that the world is in fact limited as, as you know, so even if, even when I raised it with my professors and they would just poo poo it still, it was, it was quite important for me to realize that what you said, logic, it carries the day, right? When you <laughs> when you look at these things and see that there are limits, and that it's a very inequitable world, and that the transformations that we need are tied up in those two things, um, I, it, it's it's made a big difference in my professional choices and and in my career. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I this relates to what I want to say about policy too. I believe that much of the work that ecological economists have been doing and publishing in the journal and talking about at their conferences is coming home to roost now in this decade. As we try to get to net zero, as we try to facilitate this energy transition that we're already in the middle of, that research and the ideas that have been planted that have flowered, that are, the, you know, the results are there in the libraries of the world. Um, I believe that, that, that they're going to be built on, they are already being built on. And I, I think that uh, this, this talk about the transition of whatever ism we're under, as has been talked about in a chat, uh, I think human creativity and innovation is coming forward in a way that will deal with and, and you know the supply chain of interruptions the the problems that we're facing politically in the united states and elsewhere also in china those things are all related to these key questions that that you've posited for us herman and and peter too around equity allocation and also scale so thank you i think i hope you will see it in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Um, before I come to you, Peter, I just wanted to ask um, Ben to pose his second question, which is a question to you, Ben. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I was just wondering, through the process of writing this book, um, has it changed the way that you look back on your own career and your research? Hmm. Well, I, I suppose I did take the opportunity to reflect on my own career, uh, which uh, in many ways parallels Herman's. Um, but I, was, I started out based in Britain, although I did my graduate work in Canada, uh, and I went from being an academic to a civil servant, to a private consultant, back to a civil servant, and then finally back into academia. Um, so I had a lot, much longer period outside of the academy than, than Herman did. Uh, so it's given me a sort of a different um, perspective on some things. For example, when you when 
asked about policy making. Uh, well, I was involved in policy making as a senior civil servant for a number of years. So my experiences there, I think, proved very, very valuable to me and I hope to my students when we were talking about those things. Um, my career, however, would have been different had I stayed in academia and still had some of the same ideas. Um, and it's all part of what I suppose we've been talking about a little bit here, the isolation of, of relative isolation of Herman and, and others. That's how I felt when I was working on in this way, I was a, sort of a lone figure. Um, uh, and that's one of the reasons I enjoyed writing the biography because I could see the parallels between my own intellectual development and Herman's. Um, so I don't know that I'd, I would have done anything differently, but I might, I, but I do think I probably missed out on opportunities for intellectual engagement that would otherwise have been there. Thanks, Peter. And and is there, reflecting on the conversation this evening, is there anything that you'd like to pick up on, particularly as we draw to a close? Okay, I'll uh, so many things, but I'll just mention two. First of all, this incredibly stimulating uh, exchange of views is exactly what comes from Herman's work. This is how stimulating his contributions have been over the years. Uh, there are a number of papers that I'd never heard of, uh, knew nothing about that Herman had written, um, which I spent a fair bit of time in, in the book writing about. Uh, his combination, for example, of um, uh, Marxist uh, theory and Malthusian theory, instead of seeing them as antagonistic, he found a way of combining them with a, into a very interesting analysis of, of population and class. And that's just one example. Um, so that's been very valuable. The other thing I would just like to comment on, just because it was where the conversation sort of ended up before, on the policy making and whether things are spreading out. Um, I dedicated this book to a group that I don't think anybody has heard of. I have, I, maybe apart from Herman, called the Gothic Group. Now, the Gothic Group is a group of my ex-students and sometimes some current students, if they're invited, uh, that meet periodically at my house. And we discuss all sorts of th things, some of the issues today and others. But the point I want to make is that they're all working outside academia now. They're all in government positions or the private sector. And so they are the champions that we need for the daily inspired ideas to propagate through the system. And I don't think we should overlook that. And it's been a great um, joy of my life to work with Ellie and others at the faculty of what was called the Faculty of Environmental Studies. It's changed its name recently because these are the kind of students we would attract. Uh, students who would want to learn some economics, interested in ecological economics, but in a very broad way, and then would take those ideas out uh, into practice, put them into practice in the wider world. It's not enough yet. And of course, CUSP is doing the same thing in its own way. Uh, and there are other organizations now around the world doing that. So I remain surprisingly optimistic that change is in the air and will come and we'll all owe a tremendous debt to Herman for that coming to pass. Thank you very much, Peter. I suspect that, um, and you may have to consult Maria, your wife on this, that the Gothic group may find itself besieged by would-be subscribers from our 250 or so followers on this call. So just uh, the room there doesn't look quite big enough. You might have to um, go out into the garden. Um, but, it, but that idea of, a, of an informal group um, and, and a space for conversation and, and the example that Herman has uh, given us through his work um, in creating that space for conversation, I absolutely applaud. Um, many, many thanks to, to all of you, to Ellie Perkins, to Catherine Trebek, to all of those who asked questions um, and, and apologies that we didn't manage to have time for everybody to answer them. The book, as we mentioned, is, is now published and, um, and is available from all reputable booksellers and some disreputable ones, and, um, and will hopefully be the basis for a further conversation um, for Herman's remarkable work. There was a point that Catherine made, which maybe I could just end on in a sense that that in looking at and and understanding the work of, of someone like Herman, who has changed his field, changed the way that economics thinks, changed all of our thinking on this call and, and way beyond that, and to some extent give us the foundations for a different kind of economics. That work is a part of what we celebrate, but we also do, as Catherine said, celebrate 
qualities of of the man of the person um and in in this case those qualities um herman you have shared with us very generously tonight that openness to conversation that kindness and gentleness of spirit that re re restless relentless sense of inquiry and even that work ethic which i believe you said you were going to write us another book um sometime between thinking about these things that you haven't thought enough about yet um that will undoubtedly provide the answers and and maybe if i could just finish herman with a very personal private question to you in between that thinking about these things that you haven't quite figured out yet how do you like to spend your time these days <laughs> well i uh i suppose my time is uh i like to watch the world go by see what's happening uh although that's frequently rather frustrating um, and I suppose at uh, my age and with my caregiving responsibilities and uh, sort of uh, fading physical strength, I, I devote more and more time just to the ordinary things of life, you know, uh, getting up <laughs> and paying attention to things that need to be done. And, I, and maybe I'll have a few hours each day to do some reading and thinking about all of these things. And I'm so extremely grateful for uh, the feedback and the questions that people have raised. And it gives me a considerable amount of, uh, of hope that, that uh, the, the work of ecological economics is going to fall into capable and good hands. And so uh, I'll be there to applaud it. Thank you, Herman. Uh, I think that brings us more or less to the end. I, I should say a, a particular thanks at this point also, of course, to Peter uh, for writing the book, to, for providing a, a window really into uh, the work and the life of an extraordinary man and, and for contributing that to us this evening um, and presenting some of the ideas in the book. Um, it's been a pleasure to have everybody here. I hope that you have enjoyed it. Uh, we will make sure that the video is is available for those of you who like to look at it again or to share with your friends and we look forward to that next space for what i i personally feel is an extraordinary and extremely important discussion that goes to the heart of what it means to be human of what it means to live on a finite planet and of what it means in particular of course to be an ecological economist, but in general, to be someone who thinks and engages with their social world. And, and that's an example that Herman has held up for us with remarkable clarity. Many thanks to everyone. <laughs>